Hello and welcome to Science Descripts video podcast, Women in Post-Production. My name is Ginger Ann. I am the Executive Director of the Illuminating Discovery Hub at the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery, which is located on UW-Madison's campus. At the Hub, we focus on bringing science to the people and people to the science. So what is Science Descript? Science Descript is a UW-Madison, Wisconsin Institute for Discovery initiative that's mission is to spark accurate science within storytelling and diversify scientist portrayals within story in the industry. The video podcast is a part of ongoing events hosted each year that gathers notable Hollywood industry professionals to nucleate around the production of science stories and science expertise within the filmmaking process. Today, we will be talking to three film post-production experts, Christina, a creative editor, Lynette, a senior colorist, and Mandy, a software engineer. Michael, Science Descript's writer-in-residence, and I will be leading the discussions today. Below in the video description, you will find links to film reels and trailers highlighting the works of our panelists today. And without further ado, Michael will lead us in panelist introductions. Hi, my name is Michael Graff, and I'm uh, currently the writer in residence, screenwriter in residence at the Institute. And it's uh, my great, great pleasure to introduce um, three filmmakers of, um, and you know, before we get into that, I just want to say, you know, there's an old saying in Hollywood that you make a movie three times so when you write it, when you shoot it, and when you edit it. And that pretty much is a, is a really good summary of the production process. And the, the three people we're going to talk to today um, are intimately involved with the post-production process, the, the last stage of the process of, of uh, making films. Um, the first person I'd like to introduce is uh, a woman named Lynette Dunsing. And Lynette, why don't you tell us a little bit, a bit about yourself? Well, um, I am a digital color uh, the digital colorist. Um, I do motion picture color correction um, for the post-production process. So after um, shots are edited by the lovely Christina, who you're going to meet very soon, um, after those shots are pulled, um, I go and I color correct those images so that they all live together in the same place and are very much an integral part of the storytelling in the fact that one gets the feeling about what it is you're looking at based on the amount of color or lack of color or contrast um, or definite, definite uh, deliberate details that we add to images that may not necessarily look like that when they're shot. So almost everything you see on TV or in a movie or streaming is colored by a digital color, a digital colorist or digital color uh, artist such as myself. So I started in this business about uh, 30 years ago. I started in Hollywood after moving from Michigan to Los Angeles and I started at a place called the Post Group. And that's where I learned to be a colorist. And it, in those days, it was all shot on film everything today, almost everything, with the exception of a few productions, are shot digitally. In those days, it was all done on film, and I started as a telecine operator, which was loading film onto a big machine called the telecine, and scanning that film, and doing a color correction on all the images that way. Now everything is nonlinear, um, and in the digital world. So even if something is shot on film, it's scanned, digitized, and color corrected on a number of different color platforms. So um, I work here in Hollywood um, on what's called the Da Vinci Resolve, which is a pretty well-known color correction platform, but I'm also versed in uh, Base Light and Luster, which are other color correction platforms, and they do similar things, but in a different way. So um, I started as a technical person, um, kind of more of an engineering type, and then realized that I had an artistic um, uh, acumen that I could offer the digital and um, technical part of this business. So I do kind of both. I have to run a lot of different uh, technical pieces of equipment, but I also have to have a, an eye for color and an artistry that, that goes along with that. 
So um, I've grown up through this industry and all of the different incarnations that there are of, of platforms and pieces of equipment and all the things that, that it, it takes for us to do these days. And so one of the things I'll probably end up talking about or talking um, addressing is what's happening with COVID and how that's changed what I do because so much of what I do is done remotely and we can get into the particulars of how that happens. But uh, before COVID, the company that I worked with, work for, which is called Instinctual in Hollywood, I do most of my work remotely to the Sony lot in Culver City. And um, so all of these things, you know, add up to the um, us needing to stay super current with technology and being able to just on the drop of a hat, be able to, to change with the times. So uh, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you, Lynette. Um, I'd like to all now introduce uh, everyone to uh, Christina Stumpf in Chicago. Um, Christina is an editor I've had the pleasure of working with uh, uh, for on a number of projects. Uh, Christina, take it away. Hello, nice to see everybody. My name is Christina Stumpf. I am originally from California, from San Diego, but I moved to Chicago area um, before I graduated high school. So I consider myself a Chicagoan now. Um, I started um, my career in uh, 1994, after I graduated from Columbia College, Chicago. Um, I did a couple internships, and out of one of those internships, I got my first job. And that was being a receptionist, woohoo, for a year and a half. <laughs> I was promoted to assistant editor after that, and um, was an assistant for five, I moved companies after that, and I was an assistant for five years. And that was uh, probably the hardest five years of my life. <laughs> um, you need to be on your toes the entire time. You need to be proactive. You need to make sure everything is running smooth behind the scenes. Um, you need to make sure your editor can concentrate on editing and on being creative so that they don't have to worry about all the technical stuff that uh, goes into filmmaking. Um, I <clears throat> went to California for a year in 1998 when we opened up our Santa Monica office, helped, helped open up that office, um, had the opportunity to permanently relocate out there, but my husband and I decided to, um, to stay in Chicago. So I came back to Chicago and, uh, was promoted to editor in 2001. Um, I got to work on some really great, great projects with some great directors. Um, met, met a lot of incredible people along the way. Working in a post-production facility, I mean, you're, you're, getting, you're getting clients from all over Chicago and all over um, the country. So you get to meet a lot of people in this business, um, even in post-production, you know, you think you're sitting in your little room by yourself, but I mean, there are teams and teams of people working on projects. So that was, um, that was exciting. I learned on the Avid Media Composer. Um, I, I resisted learning on Adobe Premiere for a very long time. <laughs> Um, but, uh, I just, cause I was just, you know, when your muscle memory knows how to work, you know, a certain program, it's like, you want to stick to that one. But, uh, luckily I did, I, I, I forced myself to finally learn different platforms cause you need to, everything evolves in any business, especially this one. So I'm currently edit everything on Premiere, uh, Adobe Premiere, um, which I love now. <laughs> um, let me think what else. Uh, once I became, once I was promoted to editor, I had plenty of time on my hands considered, uh, compared to once when I was an assistant, I decided to start my family. So 
a year into being an editor, I became pregnant with my twins. Um, I did, I, I continued working full time in Chicago, living in the burbs. So I was commuting three to four hours a day and that became too much. So I decided to go freelance and I've been freelancing since 2010. And uh, with all the contacts that I have had through my career in Chicago, it's been it's been great. It's been keeping me busy. People have been recommending me, or you know, my old contacts are calling me for projects. So it's it's really been great. Great. Well, thank you, thank you, Christina. Um, uh, I'd like to now uh, move over to Mandy. Mandy Hampton. Um, Mandy is here in Madison and. And um, uh, I, I have a hard time wrapping my head around what you do. If you can tell us, tell us exactly what you do. And who I you can do that. Yes. Uh, so my name is Mandy Hampton. Uh, I'm kind of the youngest one of this group, but uh, my career started in 2006, right out of school. Um, I went to the SIGGRAPH conference in LA uh, the summer of 2005 and met um, one of my my best mentors of my life. His name was Wook uh, and he hired me uh, to work at Digital Domain. So uh, I started there in 2006 as a pipeline engineer. Um, what pipeline engineers tend to do is basically uh, take all of the different pieces of a post-production pipeline and make sure that the data is moving efficiently through all of the artists. Um, so essentially you're trying to cut down on the amount of time it takes to do a task. But um, yeah, I, uh, so in terms of what things that I've worked on, um, you mentioned the Avid, Christina. Uh, I actually wrote tools to be able to, you know, put push a cut over to the Avid so the editors could look at what what people were generating that day and that kind of thing. So um, it's basically all about pipeline engineering is all about efficiency. So whatever whatever tools you can develop, uh, and it's strictly programming, but whatever tools you can develop to help people uh, move through their day. That's that's what you do. But um, so in terms of where my career went after that, um, after about five years at DD, I ended up uh, switching jobs to work for Shotgun Software. Um, they're relatively famous in the post-production world now. A lot of studios use them to track tasks. Uh, we do. We assets. do. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, it, there's something like 700 or like a thousand people, studios that use it now. So uh, that's a big, big product. But uh, so I worked there for a long time. Uh, I worked in their custom development division. I was doing uh, custom tools for Warner Brothers, Fox, um, Mattel, those, those kinds of places. Um, and then after that, uh, um, I switched to Walt Disney Imagineering. Uh, I ended up doing a very similar type of work for theme parks. Uh, it turns out most of their attractions these days are switching from more of like a physical base to uh, like screens. As you're riding through rides, they're actually projecting things on the walls. Um, so there's a lot of very similar uh, pipelines in play for theme parks now. Um, and now I find myself in the game industry. So I've, I've touched a lot of different parts, <laughs> so. Great, well, thank you. Thank you, Mandy. Um, well, I, uh, I, let, we, we've got a number of questions and I just wanted to move in. Um, this is meant to be informal. So, you know, d d there's jump in um, and feel free to, 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 to follow up or uh, jump in when, when you want. Um, I think Ginger, you've got the first question. Absolutely. So one of our first questions is what do you love about your job and what are some of the challenges? So we'll start with Christina and then we'll go to Mandy and Lynette. Okay. Um, I love getting lost in the footage, um, letting it evolve into something cool and exciting. I love using uh, visual storytelling to emote um, the emotion out of the film versus having to rely on purely music or voiceover or acting. Um, you know, getting the, the visual rhythm, again, use, use, using the visual cues within the film to keep the cadence and the rhythm going. You don't always have to edit, you know, on a, on a beat. You can use any motion that's happening in the film to do that. Um, which is really cool. Um, and just, you know, 
I had an assistant who would complain at how much I would watch one of my edited pieces back and forth because you know you don't you realize you know you're watching maybe a 30 second piece there but there could be 60 edits in it so each time you know I'm watching like for one specific piece and then I'm going to watch to see how this arm movement is going to you know move into this you know facial feature so it's like getting that's for me is also getting lost in the edit um I like to if I am editing something that's um that's that's visually rhythmic I need I I like to take the music off and any audio off and to see if it's still interesting and uh still compelling and um it's just again just getting lost in it like I'll start I usually don't get lost into editing until maybe like six or seven o'clock in the night in the evening. And then I find that it's four o'clock in the morning and it's like, oh, I need to put this down now, but wait, let me try to do this first. And then, you know, before you know it, it's six o'clock in the morning, but that's just, that's just me personally. <laughs> that sounds very familiar. I have the same problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so in terms of what I like the most, so my, uh, my, one of my favorite things about my career is that I'm constantly solving problems. Um, it, it feels like a different problem uh, every day, almost to some extent. Uh, and you're, the other great part about it is you're, you're actively helping people. So like all those little annoying things that you like hate about your job, like you're trying to figure out how to solve those for people and make their lives better. <laughs> so, so they can be less unhappy. <laughs> but um, so those are probably my two high points um, for me. Well, I think for me, um, my favorite part of my job is seeing my work out in the world in the satisfaction that comes from walking into a movie theater and seeing the work I did. Um, I do the theatrical trailers for uh, Columbia Pictures, Sony Pictures Animation, and uh, TriStar. And the, the satisfaction of seeing your work on a huge screen is pretty exciting, I have to say. Um, I also, um, go over to the uh, IMAX headquarters over in Playa Vista, and I get to see some of the work that we've worked on here at Instinctual on enormous screens. And just to see the satisfaction of my colleagues' work, we do visual effects and beauty work on, um, you know, a lot of the actors and actresses in the, in the films. So being able to go and see how that work holds up um, on a screen of that size is is pretty great. And then even just, um, you know, scrolling through Instagram and getting to see, you know, whatever it is, the latest trailer is that you've done for a, a feature film. Um, there's a lot of satisfaction in that for me. So I guess that's what my favorite part of the thing is just you work really hard on something and in trailer work, you're trying to keep shots consistent from the beginning of the trailer to the end, even though the shots that they're using are in completely different parts of the film. So you get to be another aspect of the, the storytelling and to work hard on all of those things and then to see it out there for, with everybody else and see their reaction is, is probably one of my favorite parts of my job. Well, that's great. <laughs> So, I also want some uh, colorist, some some colorist work on the Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> my Zoom face. <laughs> Maybe I should have lit myself. That would have been great. <laughs> we all have we up. all have Wisconsin winter tans. Uh, uh, North North Midwestern winter. And we're all just we need color. <laughs> hey, I understand that I'm from uh, Michigan. I, I got it. So um, you know. We, we, we're talking a lot about, um, you know, you, 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 you all have kind of mentioned uh, the post-production pipeline. And I, I think, you know, one of the things it, if um, people don't realize is that when you are editing, whether it's a, or working on a feature film or a TV show or uh, a music video or a TV commercial, the amount of footage 
the amount of data is enormous, absolutely enormous. And you, you are, you're, you're being paid, you're being paid um, for the most part hourly or daily, and you're, you're responsible for moving all kinds of data back and forth. Um, can you um, talk about, uh, going to kind of go into the weeds about what the current post-production pipeline for moving that data looks like and what it will look like in the future. And, and, and Lynette, you touched on this, talking a little bit about um, how COVID has been um, changing things or may have changed things. Right, well, for me, we don't move the data. The data lives somewhere. So uh, somebody has gone and I know Mandy could talk about this uh, in depth much better than I, but just for our situation, um, everything lives on the server at the mothership and we're not moving anything. We're, all we do is just like, I have a, a suite at home um, and so I can control, I use an RGS I, to control my box back at here at Instinctual. So um, I don't have to move, I don't have to upload or download anything. Um, I've got a, a color correct monitor and um, our proprietary color connect system, which allows me to see uh, color accurately, the output of my of my box at work. So I don't have to move anything. All we're doing is streaming images. So either either it's streaming just to me or we connect it to the client. So from my house, I can show my client in New York what it is I'm working and all this stuff is streaming from, from the, uh, the servers where I am. Is this a departure from the way it, uh, you kind of broke up for me a little bit, Michael. Oh, I'm sorry. Is this a departure for the way it used to be? Um, not for us. We've been working on a remote pipeline for about four years. Um, just because we're our, you know, where I work is in Hollywood and our client is in Culver City. And when you live in Los Angeles, you don't want to get into traffic. So you go and go from your office down to the basement of the uh, Thalberg building in Culver City. And there are six theaters down there. And we have a sister theater there that is completely aligned and calibrated to our specification. So I go there. I was actually just there a few days ago just to double check because I have, I had a remote session uh, yesterday to, to that location. So for us, it hasn't really changed. The only thing that's changed, and I don't want to take up any but too much other time, but we have already had this remote pipeline, which was, um, you know, 2K444. Um, and not a lot of other facilities have that, that we've had that for a long time. But the other thing yesterday is I had to also stream um, via Evercast to um, five other locations at the same time on a different streaming platform, which we would never have done before. Because, but now people are sitting in their living room to watch besides coming into the, the theater. Cool. <clears throat> um, I can, oh, oh, yeah, you go ahead. Yeah. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so I can speak to that a little bit. So um, when I first started my career, everything was was hard drives uh, and archival space and whatever else uh, in the actual studio itself, um, which was, I mean, it's 2006, computers were still a little newish, kind of, you know. But um, since then, we've had kind of a couple different transitions. The first was to more of a network drive space. Um, uh, like hosting your own type of data so that multiple people could log in from elsewhere and, and connect to it. But the second big one, and this is one we went through at Shotgun, was instead of just one server location, you actually move to a cloud fully so that things can be geolocated, uh, making it easier for people that are working in Europe to get things faster, things that are you know in, in Asia, they can pull things down faster. Um, so that's been kind of the second major change in, in the whole pipeline, from my perspective at least. But 
I was just going to say in, in my field as an editor, um, you know, editing is down and dirty. Uh, like Lynette was saying with, with film color correction, the footage I get is usually flat, which means all the color has been taken out um, so that the colorist can have the raw file and have complete control of every little bit of information that's in that file. Um, so anyway, so I'm usually editing with um, with an image that that looks almost black and white, you know, on the grayscale. Um, I, I have the opportunity to put a LUT on there, which is just an overall color correction, just to give it some color, <laughs> some pop. But um, but a lot of times I'm just editing with the flat. I just get used to editing with that because I'm just looking at the storyline versus how pretty it looks, you know? Um, so in that case, m the pipeline for me is real simple. I mean, I, I receive a drive from the production company and usually it's it's low res, um, which is easier to work with. If it's, if it's the high res raw, I will, um, I'll transcode it so it's lower res so that my computer can deal with all the information and not have to process all the information for each edit. So um, so when I'm working when I'm working on something, um, it's drive based mostly. Um, sometimes they'll they'll send me links with the footage on it, but that will take, you know, because I'm working out of my house, that'll take <laughs> too long to download. So I always request a drive. Um, and then, uh, after that, it's just all, all data back to the, back to whoever's finishing it. So it's as far as, um, sending them my EDL, which is the edit decision list, which really is just telling like Lynette's computer, what the endpoint is and then what the out point is of each clip that I'm using. And then that way she only has to deal with literally 30 seconds worth of this, the footage in my commercial that I'm using versus the six hours that they shot, you know, to edit this commercial together. So I think it's a little bit different than what you guys were talking about, but on the editorial aspect of it, that's uh, pretty down, down and dirty. Just, uh, just get it done. <laughs> Great. Um, you know, we, there's, um, um, a lot of talk in the industry now, um, I last, uh, over the, the last year with the pandemic, I know that the, um, the director's guild, um, they, they spent their entire last, um, science forum or, um, kind of high tech, um, forum last summer talking only about virtual production, um, and virtual reality. And I was wondering if, um, if any of you have had um, have been working with virtual reality. Um, um, I know that changes the pipeline. It changes a lot of the work done that's typically been done in post production. It changes it to pre production, the, the first part of the process. Um, I was just wondering if any of you have, have touched on that or had any experience with that. Well, not for myself, I could say. I mean, it, um, as far as virtual reality, I mean, the only thing that would come close to that is certainly the visual effects pipeline where, you know, you're having to marry things that are not there together. Um, I also do a lot of animation, but that's about as close as I get to anything where you're doing an actual virtual reality narrative situation, which I don't know how much there is of that necessarily. I mean, there's a lot of virtual virtual reality things, basically what Mandy's talking about in these theme parks and and such. That would, would be a big thing. So maybe I should just be quiet and have Mandy talk about that because uh, I don't think I don't think I could even come close to that. <laughs> All good. Uh, she's right. Uh, there is a lot of virtual reality happening at theme parks. I wasn't directly involved with that, so I don't know how much I can speak to it uh, particularly. But um, from what I saw of the pipeline, it's actually remarkably similar. It just happens in a different order to some extent. So 
Um, but the other really cool thing that has been happening the last couple of years, and one of my really good friends has been working on it, is um, the LED walls with game engines. Um, those are starting to pop up for certain situations. I know the Mandalorian has been filming with that. Uh, a lot of sportscasters are using that now. And basically what it is is an entire stage filled with <laughs> walls with LEDs on them. And it essentially mimics whatever environment you want to be in on a, on a real-time basis. So they can change the sunset, they can change the clouds, they can change the rocks if they're in the way. Um, and it, you're essentially moving all of that kind of compositing, modeling, whatever type of work into the game engine that's happening live while you're filming. So um, I think that will, will actually be a really big change to the industry when that finally gets going. I didn't think about that. Um, using the LED walls or thinking about that as the virtual reality, but I guess that it would be part of it. I'm just, um, finished working on a Pepsi, a flight of Pepsi commercials for a Chicago client and all of the backgrounds are LED walls. Yeah. Which for a colorist brings its own challenges because if you have to make sure that the color management of <laughs> whatever they're using for the LED wall matches what it is that you're working in. And sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. And then eventually you have to get mats anyway for the backgrounds. True story. <laughs> yeah. that, that, that's kind of the dirty little secret in virtual reality from what I'm discovering from talking to people is that even like with shows like The Mandalorian, there's still an awful lot of cleanup work afterwards because for that very same reason is that the, 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 the foreground elements and the, and the VR elements don't always match. Right. And that is the, the bane of our existence, too. I mean, we um, have to marry elements of different color spaces constantly, and you have to manage that. And it's, it's not that straightforward. Sometimes if you have a mat from the visual effects, then you can go and manage, you know, specific parts separately. Like I'm working on a, a movie called the Hotel T right now, Hotel Transylvania. For, for Sony Pictures. And then all of a sudden, I mean, all this stuff is working in ACES. If, if anybody is familiar with working in ACES, I'm sure there will be a number of people out there that are, but, um, but at the ACES uh, uh, color space is very specific and everything has, you have these input transforms and output transforms, but if you have something married inside of them that are not the same flavor of whatever it is that you have, then you've got to find a way to transform it and get them together, which is something I'm working on right now where they've taken something that is a, an EX, a open EXR ACES file and put it together with the QuickTime in the same shot. So for something like that, I would need to have mats made to do it. That's what it's easy. That's why it's super easy to just do that in in editorial. It's like, oh, just cut it together. It looks great. Oh wait, we're <laughs> gonna have to finish that later and make it all really look great. Sorry, Lynette. <laughs> well, that's and that's exactly what happens. You know, even from a vendor who is uh, used to doing these kinds of things, and they send you, and they and a lot of times they don't tell you what it is, and yeah. you have to you have to figure out. What is it? Was this Sony Venice footage? Was this Ari Alexa? Is this a QuickTime? Is this Asus CCC? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's it, why communication is very important between between right. different post production houses. To, yep, it's it'll save a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of money. <laughs> right, <laughs> it's always the way mm -hmm. communication. The one thing that we've been talking a little bit about here and was mentioned earlier is this balance of both that technology side and then also the artistic side and having both of those expertise when approaching the work. And so one of the questions that we had for, for you all is, where did you start? Did you start on the technology side? Did you start on that art side? And could you explain a little bit of the balance between that, what we call STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math training, and the work that you do now? We'll start with Mandy and then go Lynette and then Christina. Sure. So I'm probably an interesting case. I am almost 100% tech. Um, I, my degree is in computer engineering. I started right away as a pipeline engineer, and I've basically been developing ever since. 
Um, basically, I've learned from the artists, so I know the terminology and you know, how things connect and all that other stuff. But my my entire career has basically just been developing. So, um, yeah, and and originally when I was uh, eight years old, I thought I wanted to be an animator, and I ended up in the development side anyway. So, <laughs> but yeah. Well, I started on the technical side. I was the, the uh, technical operations supervisor at the post group before I became a telecine operator. So I, I had the um, ability to see things in a technical way, but also was an art history minor in school. So I knew that I had a technical ability. Um, I was running camera and tape machines and shading cameras and running audio and doing all these things when I came out of college. And it wasn't until I got into a facility that I saw an opportunity to take the technical knowledge that I have and put it into an artistic um, direction. I didn't even know that any such thing existed when I was in school there because there were no telecines in college back in those days, way in the way back machine. So um, it took me going into a facility, which is when I talk to young people a lot of times, sometimes you don't really know what it is you want to do till you see it, until you're exposed to that. And so I had that technical background and was able to walk into a role where um, I was helpful to the colorist that I was supporting at the time and then able to go and learn the artistic side of it once I had mastered, or not mastered, but at least had the technical part of that job down. And then, of course, growing with it as it goes, because the evolution of everything is, you know, keeping up with the tech and also keeping up with the styles of what is, what is a popular look, what is beautiful. Beautiful things are different to different people and how to make things and how to communicate artistic vision. And um, so just all of those things are learned along the way, at least they were for me. Uh, being an editor is an artistic um, type, of a, type of a career, but I had to start out with the technical aspect of it. So being in this, I mean, starting out, you're not going to start out as an editor. You're going to start out as an assistant editor. Um, well, especially back when I started, because there wasn't a whole lot of remote or freelance uh, editors back in the day. So you had to work at a post-production company. So you start out, you know, on the lower levels. So, um, so I had to learn all about the technical aspects of film. Um, I had to learn how to sync the production audio to the, to the footage. I had to learn how to prep any graphics um, that we received to give to the editor so that they can easily use it. Um, I had to learn how to prep the final edit to go to finish, to go to color, to go to final mix, to go to online. So that's all technical. Um, I, my, my, uh, when I was hired at my second job, which was called the Looking Glass Company at the time, who eventually merged with the White House Company in London, and now they're all over the place and a really, really great post-production company. They hired me because I knew how to, um, work tape decks because the first company I worked for, um, they had a whole room of, of all the tape decks, all the beta, three quarter, one inch. I don't think we had two inch, but, um, but <laughs> since I knew how to, how to work all those machines, um, this looking glass company was brand new. They had one assistant who was hired who um, wasn't, uh, wasn't familiar with that type of technology. And I came in saying, hey, I can do that for you. And they hired me and it was perfect. So I ran the tape deck room for uh, for a, a, like a year and a half, getting it uh, in working order for them. And, and then I would sit with my editor and watch how they were working the film. And that's how, you know, the, 
you know, you work the creative into it if that's what your, you know, what your goal is. But definitely my, the first few years in my career was definitely all technical and started until I started taking over some of the edits and doing revisions for the editor or doing, um, you know, you have the opportunity to just play with the edit once the editor leaves for the day. Um, you could take your own sequence and, and play around, but you need to be proactive about that on your own. So, um, so yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And building off of that, I'm in a, this is a two-part question that's combining some of the questions we received from the public. Um, one of what, going to um, some of what you were just mentioning is what is some of the technology skills and the art skills you recommend that folks that are interested in your career paths learn about now, um, especially with the changing industry? And then the second part to that question being um, specific to if you are a 14 year old girl looking at learning more about this, what are things that you can do at that stage um, and learn about or different kinds of resources that might help with learning about these different careers? And we'll start with Christina and then Mandy and then Lynette. Okay, okay. for, if you wanna get into editing, um, the, the tools um, you should look into are all the Adobe products. So be it Premiere Pro for editing, um, After Effects for uh, graphic, uh, simple animation, definitely Photoshop. I mean, it, I know all the kids know Photoshop better than I do at this point. <laughs> um, so those are, those are pretty avid media composer, but um, I know that's, that's, I don't know. On a consumer level, they're becoming uh, less expensive, so you can buy their program. They used to be really expensive, um, so they were they were mo mo mostly used in facilities who couldn't afford them. That's why people started, you know, you, Adobe was great with Premiere because it's very affordable. Um, and then um, for a fourteen-year-old girl who is looking to get into this business, I would say. Um, like anything else, YouTube. You can start looking at YouTube. Um, you should be able to download Premiere Adobe products. I'm not sure with a student, um, as a student for much cheaper. Um, and just uh, they have um, they have the professional platform, and then they also have uh, an easier platform that you can use. Um, just study, if you wanna get into editing, just study film, stu study the different, different genres, um, different directors, different editors, um, see how they cut from scene, to, from, from scene to scene, or see how they edit emotional scenes or, versus, or how they edit fast paced, like sports scenes, just consume, 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 consume. When I was uh, when I was working uh, at the post facility and with all my colleagues, we would always be talking about movies or commercials or music videos. So, and we'd sit there and we would watch. You know, it looked like we weren't working, but we were watching movies together and talking about it. Um, uh, read up on different directors or editors' philosophies. Um, on how they approach their work, just uh, go out there and research. Um, research the artists that you like. Um, and you can start, um, like with every, every editor that I worked for as an assistant, I would take little bits that I liked that they did and incorporate it into my workflow. And some stuff I kept and some th stuff I, it's like, okay, that's not really my style. And uh, it's always, always evolving. Every project up to this date that I do, I always learn something new. And uh, that's from, again, researching online, looking at new styles that are, are that's out there. Um, and and as, as an assist, as a freelance editor, I don't always have an assistant. So I am always on YouTube, figuring out how to do something on uh, Adobe uh, products. So... <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, yeah, so I'll jump in. So my uh, advice is a little bit more school based. Uh, there are, uh, thankfully, a lot of uh, development classes now popping up in high schools uh, and a lot in colleges around the uh, country. Um, when I started, the first thing that uh, caught my attention that this might be the career path for me is I was uh, actually writing little programs on my scientific calculator. <laughs> so if you enjoy doing that, <laughs> that this might be for you. Um, <laughs> Uh, I ended up uh, really enjoying math uh, classes just because of the logic. So that kind of sent me in the direction of computer science, computer engineering. Uh, when I was in college, they almost exclusively taught C++ uh, and Java. And uh, I would, since I have graduated from college, I have not touched it once. So uh, al almost exclusively pipeline engineers are writing in scripting languages. And the most common one these days is Python. Uh, it's kind of taking over the world. So if you if you're familiar with, with that one, you can do all kinds of careers. <laughs> um, uh, in terms of uh, other other ideas, so there are a lot of companies in Hollywood, especially the bigger ones that have really good internship programs. Disney, I know, has one. They call it a Code Rosie program, uh, and that's they even use that for uh, people that want to transition from uh, other careers to program programming jobs, and it's specifically targeted at girls and women. Uh, trying to bring them up in the technology fields um, just because of the, you know, the lopsidedness of the industry um, is so bad, but um, don't be afraid. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> but yeah, uh, and uh, one other recommendation, uh, SIGGRAPH every year puts on a whole bunch of different presentations and talks. Um, a lot of them are development based on tools people have written. Uh, or things that they wrote into some pipeline. Uh, if you find any of those interesting, that would that's also a really good good avenue. So, well, I think for me, there's a there's a few things um, because this is kind of a technical job and an artistic job. Um, taking film classes or going to film school. Um, in a generalist sense, like a place that's great, like Columbia College, is just understanding how films are made, understanding the process, um, going into art or um, cinema history classes and understanding filmmaking and studying different directors and different looks and all of that. And you know, nowadays with all of the different platforms for color correction you know, with so many things that you see on Netflix or in the theater, these all have very, very specific and different looks. And understanding um, what a filmmaker is trying to convey through color is, I think, a really important thing. But getting back to what, um, speaking to what Mandy was saying, is just um, being able to take a class where you understand where you're understanding pipeline and also understanding file management. That is one of the biggest things in doing what we do. And it's one of the things that can hold you up from being able to do your job efficiently or to be able to share assets with other facilities and things of that nature. So understanding pipeline, understanding file management for sure, which will allow you to be an asset to get into a facility where you can learn the color correction part of it. Now, in the case of a 14 year old girl wanting to go and follow her color dream, I would have to say that Resolve, um, the Resolve Black Magic platform is probably the easiest way to start that because you can download that for free for free from the internet, from their site. And you can start taking tutorials, as Christina mentioned, and start to learn basics. So, and there are so many people nowadays, as I see the, the young kids, because you, your phone is a, is a video camera and you can edit your own stuff and you can create your own looks and you can start to play with things like that. And um, a color correction platform like Resolve that you can do for free um, to, as a beginner um, is a great way to start and a great way to see if you're interested in it or that you have the talent or that's what you want to do. But that's what I'd say to do. Uh, 
in just to follow up on on what all three of you are talking about, it, it, you know, the importance of art history and cinema history, um, it, as far as learning the language, the vi the, the language of of visually communicating, and um, specifically, um, you know, the the greatest editors in Hollywood history, by and large, have all been women. And um, you look at the, at the great films from the golden era of cinema in the 60s, 70s, and you've got women like Dee Dee Allen and Thelma Schoonmaker and Verna Fields and Anna Coates, and um, go and watch their those films and watch how they were edited. And the editor, as, as a director, I am saying the editor is just as important to the overall look of the film as anything that the director brings to the table. So um, I think that's that, that I think that's really important, kind of kind of boning up on on the, the history of cinema and the, the, the and the art history as well. Um, I, this isn't on any of the our questions list, but it, it came up in a conversation that Ginger and I had the other day, and I just I want to throw this out there because um, Lynette, I don't know if you remember this, but I started uh, my career out of college at the Post Group as a very naive and um, uh, bumbling. Uh, I, I wasn't even an assistant editor. I was hired below an assistant editor in the tape vault and was promoted into and, and was working up. And Lynette, you um, you were the only woman in the film unit. Um, you, uh, well, I think about you and Mary Boutet were the only two women in the film unit. And it was by and large, mostly men. But I have to tell you that um, you, whenever I had an amazingly stupid question, uh, <laughs> you would always take the time to answer that question. And, and you um, were, were very much a, a mentor to a very young uh, person just trying to start out in the industry. And, and it didn't matter how busy you were, um, if uh, you would find time to, to answer questions of someone trying to learn. And Christina, um, you also uh, have been a huge mentor for a, a, a mutual friend of ours, uh, a, a, a young editor named Calvin, who, who, uh, who always, always talks about how you have been a big mentor to him in his career. And I just want um, you guys to touch, uh, or maybe just talk about, um, you know, I, I think there's a difference. There's a there's a difference when working, you know, between a, a group of men working together, and when 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 there is a workplace with both men and women. And you you both have um, have have taken time to help the next generation behind you. And I'm just wondering if if you if you had any thoughts or could touch on that or talk about that. Well, um, I have to say that you get from the universe what you give back to the universe is the way I feel about it. It's just, I have had mentors in my life that were very, very helpful to me in finding my way. And if I didn't return that, I, I just, I don't, under, I don't understand people who can't share that. Mostly insecure people who you know, can't let go of, of what they have. And I'm a mentor for the uh, Hollywood uh, Professional Association for the Young Entertainment Professionals. And this is uh, something that is a really huge part of just my whole career is feeling that I really need to repay or pay forward what's been given to me by people who are also generous in helping me. I have been the only generally woman in color departments at almost every place I've been. But I did have some male mentors that helped me along the way and helped me to learn because that's how we learn. And we learn from other people. We learn by asking questions. And some people you can ask and some people maybe are not so generous with that. But um, I have to conduct my life that way. It's just to be appreciative of everything that I've been given. Definitely. And to add to that, um, I remember how scared I was coming out of school. 
and we're going into school is like, how am I going to do this? I, I wasn't actually going to go to film school because how saturated the industry is. And I had one friend who told me, who said, do you feel like you will regret that decision for the rest of your life? If you don't go to film school, if you don't try. And I sat there and thought about it and it's like, yes, I will definitely regret that decision. I have to at least try. So coming out of school, um, you know, it's like, where do I go? How do I start? Um, you do rely on people. You ask questions. Um, you learn real quick who to ask questions and, you know, who will not really be out there to help you. Um, so I, again, I also try to pay it forward. Um, if I see somebody who's working hard, who has passion, who has a great work ethic, um, and they're trying, I'm going to help them. And it helps that um, the Looking Glass Company slash the White House was co-owned by a, a woman. And um, so we had, there were two female editors working there when I was an assistant and we had several female assistants. So it was a pretty, pretty uh, proactive company as far as integrating women and men. Um, all my editors were men um, that I assisted for and they were all great mentors. Um, I wouldn't change it for anything, but. Yeah, I'll just uh, jump on really quick. Christina, your story is basically identical to mine. Uh, yeah, I said I was I was about to graduate from college. I went and watched Narnia, and I realized that I would regret it forever if I never gave it a shot. So mm -hmm. uh, I ended up in LA, and here we are. But um, it, to Lynette's point, uh, the industry has kind of been built on mentoring as a whole. Um, there's you can't go to school and learn about almost all of these things unless you're going explicitly to an artist school and maybe then you're learning some of the pieces but mm -hmm. you it is on the job training you have to train people uh, or there won't be anyone else coming up so mm -hmm. um, yeah and that brings up a really um, interesting point about you know it's that idea that this is an industry of you know who you know um, and that being a part of the training and especially what it means when there's not a lot of people that look like you or that can role model what might be professional trajectories for you and how that mentoring becomes so key um, from existing experts in the area. So thank you for the three of you and the mentoring that you've done for, for the new and up and coming generations. I'm gonna switch our last question here on a bit of a, 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 positive, and ex a positive note of how how to approach his career. So how, um, what kind of advice would you give your younger self um, in the profession that you've now, you know, that you're now experts in? I've got a big one on this because it's what I say to all the young people that I talk to, especially when we're talking about women, is to never self-deprecate. Mm -hmm. This is a very, very big problem for women. So we always feel that we have, can't rock the boat because there's a lot of uh, people in the, the room that don't look like us They're, and they can feel that it's being bitchy or it's being, um, you know, too forward or, or whatever, or always having to, to apologize. And if I could say anything to my younger self from, you know, 30 years ago, that would be it is to be confident in who you are and what you do and your opinion and to not let anyone feel any less of you for putting that forward. And that's what I would say. Yeah, confidence is, um, you, you, unfortunately, um, you know, you gain that through the years and through wisdom. Um, luckily, I mean, hopefully you go into it with confidence. I mean, you know your ability to, to, to deal with life. Um, but absolutely, I agree with that 100%. Um, I don't then, think men have that problem is the, my point in that there is much. Mm -hmm. No, no, right, there is a perception. Um, and there is a perception um, which is not as strong now as it was back in the day. Um, you know, you've got the boys club, there's still the boys club. Um, you know, I was passed over for a beer commercial because they didn't think I'd be able to handle a bunch of guys in my edit room, you know, 
doing this beer commercial. And literally this week, I've been, I was called personally, I'm friends with uh, the one of the creative uh, who did the Budweiser What's Up campaign. In fact, I assisted on that commercial. But um, but he's calling me now to uh, to work on his projects. So it's like if I knew back then that I would have still been able to keep these contacts, you know, I wouldn't have taken it as hard. You know, I would have. It, it's easier to move on knowing that it's still going to be okay. You know, you may not you may get passed over for some things, but just do what you do. Be true to yourself, and that's what people respect the most is if you're true to yourself, then that's great. If you're a homebody and you own it, people aren't gonna say, oh, she's no fun because she doesn't go out with a you. They're gonna say, all right, cool. She's true to herself, that's awesome. Um, yeah, just, just uh, I 100% agree with what Lynette was saying. Um, that's, a, that's a big one. And I think it's, I think it is, evolving now it's getting easier but it's still it's still definitely out there the different perceptions of being a strong woman it's a yeah. tight rope it's kind of a, a little bit of a balancing act you still have to try and mm -hmm. present it so that people aren't threatened from time to time it's it's, Which not, is ridiculous. it's not easy <laughs> You, also have to, you have to feel out everybody's personality a little bit too, because there are people that will be receptive to it and there are people that will shut it down almost immediately. So um, depending on who you're talking to, you're going to have a different approach potentially. But um, I would say uh, at least as a personal struggle for me. So uh, telling my younger self, uh, imposter syndrome is a real thing. <laughs> and uh, don't be afraid of it. <laughs> it's normal. <laughs> um, just trust your gut, ask questions, you'll learn on the way. And almost everyone is out to help you, not to, to slow you down. So um, that would be my advice to myself. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks so much, everyone. This has been amazing talking to the three of you and learning more about your career trajectories and um, some advice that you have for folks that are interested in these industries. What you speak to, I feel can be, it transcends so many different fields um, and, and that advice that's needed and to stay true to oneself. And um, Christina, what, what you were talking about earlier is the idea of, you know, you're gonna regret the decisions you don't make more than this, the decisions that you do. And so being able to pursue that, um, to pursue those dreams and see where it takes you and then just staying true to your craft and your your fingerprint your branding of that craft and that's what's going to get you ahead thank you for joining us today for science to scripts video podcast women in post production to learn more about science to script and future events visit us at science to script dot illuminating discovery dot